again to Yoav and Vicky for organizing the conference today and inviting me to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be amongst everybody. And uh, as I'm in the final position on, on a panel, I have the liberty of doing a couple things. A, uh, not to cover ground already covered, so I can give a bit of time back. Um, uh, but then to share perhaps the a perspective, a perspective particularly coming from a, a private sector operator that has a that has a global footprint, and um, you know as Prakash said, and uh, that I agree, the question that had been put to the panel as to whether international cooperation on cybersecurity is feasible, the answer is it's essential. Uh, it's essential to ensure that there is user confidence. Uh, it is essential because of the borderless nature of the cyber environment and the cyber threat uh, means that the dependencies are not only difficult to measure, but they are international by default. So uh, we must find ways to work together. Uh, what I'll do just briefly in my remarks is to share uh, some perspective on uh, how at and sees some of the, the, the risk environment evolving, that'll be very brief because it's, it's well understood in this crowd. But then a few ideas, and perhaps we'd consider them tactical ideas, on some of the steps that can be taken to improve the atmosphere of trust that's, that's uh, necessary in this uh, and, and to make um, fairly concrete progress on cooperation. First of all, just in terms of how as a company we, we see this evolving from a global footprint standpoint, uh, you know, we are licensed and operating in uh, over 60 countries. We have agreements essentially to every country of the world, whether it is for traditional voice data services, for mobile roaming, uh, for internet services as well, and uh, we serve Customers, multinational customers that that are that are globally engaged. Um, so the environment uh, is 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 by nature uh, cross border at all times, uh, and it's a, it's a it's a risk environment that we have recognized for a very long time. As discussed, as Jennifer discussed, must be proactive. And we have over 1,200 people who are just dedicated to doing the work in the area. It's very much the, the science. Of predictive and preventative efforts on, on cybersecurity because none of this is none of this is static. Certainly, the the adversaries are not. Um, Trend-wise, in terms of how things are evolving and why all the efforts become even more essential for international cooperation, uh, is again in, in a way something that Jennifer mentioned. The traditional notions of perimeter defense are increasingly irrelevant. Um, you know, it's kind of the time has passed from taking a perimeter approach to security, and the time will soon pass of it simply being enough to do network-based security. As we move further and further into an environment where the exchanges of information are cloud-based and to mobile endpoints, uh, again, we're going to need to move to a, a new a new model and a new set of strategic thinking on security because everything is very porous. Uh, the, the threats where they come from um, and the ability to uh, anticipate them are, are increasingly uh, going to defy boundaries. Um, yet we can never stop. I mean, the cybersecurity effort is the cost of doing business in a connected world. And so unless anyone has uh, proposals, and sometimes some proposals are floated, of uh, trying to create a fortress or a fragment or their own separate part in the world, there are fairly substantial economic uh, costs associated with that. So let me say a few things about some of the priorities and perhaps some of the opportunities for international cooperation. And I'll, I'll break it into three parts. First, much more can be done in terms of international collaboration in sometimes fairly fundamental ways. Uh, second, and I'll come back to all these points in a bit more detail, um, 
we should have a conversation about what, what do we mean in terms of public-private partnerships and, and the roles of all parties in this. And then third, um, as has been already discussed on prior panels, improved cybercrime uh, enforcement and cooperation. So the, the, the first point, uh, international collaboration. Uh, much has been said about the need for trust and a high degree of trust. And uh, indeed, to the extent that international alliances can be built, uh, built as uh, broad as possible, uh, while maintaining a high degree of trust, and including governments, companies, NGOs, civil society, based on some common set of principles and practices, uh, this is a, an, an essential an essential step that not enough is being done on. Um, just as a, an initial example, uh, more in terms of voluntary working relationships uh, that can be called upon to coordinate in the event of a large attack and then could help mitigate damage uh, could take place, including solely among private sector ISPs. Uh, fairly interesting experience that our chief security officer had not so long ago uh, when trying to organize a conference simply to build relationships uh, amongst different uh, CSOs of major companies around the world was that it was incredibly difficult even to identify who the CSO was in many of the companies. Uh, and so if that isn't in place, uh, then some of the necessary relationships are not in place and the trust is not in place to quickly uh, work together and, and mitigate attacks. So much more can be done. Very as simple as building relationships. And uh, I tell you, it's not uh, in the place it should be at this point. Um, Jennifer referenced before um, regional exercises or even bilateral exercises. Uh, I also fully support that notion. Uh, one of the best ways that you can discover and then subsequently manage the interdependencies that you have in the cyber environment is through conducting these bilateral or regional, sometimes multilateral exercises. Because with each of these events and each initiative, you expand your understanding of um, the complementary nature of the work that you have and, and the respective capabilities and, and also vulnerabilities. More can be done there. And then uh, another area that uh, there is some, some more exploration is the development of mutual aid agreements. And these, these, are, these are interesting concepts where, and you see it in some practice, where uh, many actors, although they may even be competitors in many environments, will agree that in the space of resiliency, uh, they will help in, um, say, hosting the content of another uh, or, or otherwise help in assisting the data. So that's, that's another area. Now, move to public A lot needs to be done to work very intensively to make sure that there are sufficient industry-led efforts to protect critical infrastructure. And, and I come at this from the standpoint of saying very predictive and proactive and constantly innovative in your security framework. Um, what can be is if in, in context, a government of security is more of a checklist or a check the box set of regulations, a very much a compliance mentality where uh, rigid requirements are set out and say, you must do this, this, this. Uh, at, at times, that can both divert resource from thinking around the curve and focus on compliance and just addressing issues that are, are uh, and then by stating what the checklist is, you all make it more predictable for the adversary to know what the, uh, what the defense so um, very much encourage that uh, there should be flexibility in how industry can respond and, and a very strong encouragement for 
uh, investment in new capabilities. Uh, another area in terms of the public-private partnership that requires a lot of very careful work uh, and more needs to be done is how to both at the same time <coughs> protect the interests of privacy but also improve the real-time sharing of uh, analysis on cyber threat information. It's a, it's a delicate balance. Uh, more needs to be done. Uh, the, the, the current um, status of things in most countries is that there, there are disincentives on, on sharing, which obviously does not uh, um, kind of optimize the ability to respond. And the final point, uh, it, it merits a lot more emphasis. Um, you know, the pursuit of uh, cyber criminals across borders, including in jurisdictions that are sanctuaries for bad behavior, uh, is something that um, uh, merits it's not easy, it's very difficult, um, but of course, pursuing a cyber criminal in a place where there is not strong law enforcement commitment is near impossible. Uh, there's already been a fair amount of talk about the Budapest Convention, uh, a lot of points have been raised about it being less than perfect, but it is, it is an effective mechanism that is there, it is there now, uh, for, uh, as a framework that can be improved with more participation. Um, another area that uh, I think merits a lot of work in this area is streamlining the mutual legal assistance treaties that exist between countries. Uh, there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of concern that the MLAP process is not as streamlined or as efficient or effective as it should be, and it's someone who disagrees with that complaint. And uh, it is an area where if approved, also help with the, again, the trust and the cooperation and the coordination across borders. And uh, finally, an interesting idea that I've heard some people talk about is the creation of a new of an international cyber crime center, something that would be complementary to existing mechanisms such as, such as Interpol, but to focus on solving crimes and, and achieving successful prosecution. And uh, it's, a, it's a notion that I think certainly bears some consideration to see if this, this type of idea, along with other ideas such as elevating the concept of cyber coordination by having cyber attaches from one country to another country and embassies who are specialists on this topic, specialists at resolving the MLAT concerns and can help with the coordination. All of these points that I raise, although tactical, are uh, in the realm of imagination and they are and they are trust-building measures, uh, and, and they are experience-building measures to find out what is the extent to which an extended number of actors can work together. And again, as it has been said before and has to be constantly said, it's, it's governments, it's private sector, it's NGOs, it's civil society, it's academia, uh, involvement of, of all. So with that, I'll, I'll pause, and we may have some more discussion during the questions. Thank you. So I'll, I think I'll, I'll take over from one of your ideas uh, that you mentioned uh, at the end. Uh, just uh, for to ignite our uh, our discussion, I'd like to uh, to say.